Thank you, Vikram. I am delighted to be here. Um, about two years ago, our foundation, based in Princeton, was approached by uh, Princeton University, Woodrow Wilson School of International Studies, to uh, pilot a program of U.S.-India relations, which is what tonight's topic is. There was no such program in uh, Princeton University, and they wanted to create because uh, the U.S. government felt, this conversation started about three years ago, the U.S. government felt that uh, this kind of intellectual exchange was important, not only at the level of government leaders who are there, but also thinkers, think tanks, scholars. So they asked the Infinity Foundation to give the seed grant, which we did. So first we had a weekend workshop where a number of uh, prominent Indian thinkers were brought, uh, along with uh, American uh, international relations and political thinkers, and we brainstormed uh, what are some of the areas that, at the thinker-to-thinker -thinker level, there ought to be some dialogue going on. And then we uh, sponsored a, a, four, four, a series of four uh, visitors from India, very, very big name people. Uh, each of them gave some talks and seminars and so on, just to test out how the Princeton University community would feel and whether this is useful. And the idea was if they felt it useful, then they would take it over as a normal uh, program. So they have taken that over as a normal program. So it is now, a, a, we don't have to support it. They've got much more money than we have. So once they like it, then our job is done. Now they uh, would do this in school, and uh, the government help has created this as a permanent, ongoing dialogue for conferences and so on. So the reason I mentioned this is that uh, one of the first, well, the first, the first visiting lecture under this new program is actually tonight in Princeton. And by the by, uh, there's no way I could tell around that, look, we got to change the date one more time. So I'm here, but I told them that I'm here because I have a, I, there's a passion for this center, and I'm here for that reason, to support this center. Uh, another, uh, and, and, one, and one of the, I draw on some of the discussion we've had. We've had discussion on the strategic importance of Myanmar, which neither US nor India have recognized. The whole seminar we did on that, that how China is making a whole uh, shortcut from the Indian Ocean and the oil supply uh, to, through Myanmar, to, through Tibet, to China, bypassing the whole uh, business of going around Southeast Asia and the states, Straits of Malacca, which are very vulnerable to being blockaded or something. It saves them about 2,000 kilometers, saves them a lot of money and, uh, and uh, time, and uh, improves their security. And so they've kind of taken over that government, made it into a client state, so that they can get access to that. And these are things that uh, you often people aren't even thinking about because people are saying, well, who bothers about them? It, the China case, a lot about them. So it affects both the US and India in terms of their uh, the relationships in, in the bigger sense. Uh, I've also been very uh, close to the Tibetan community. I've done a lot of, uh, for the last 15 years, supported a lot of Tibetan causes. Uh, Tibet House in uh, New York, we've done many, many things with them and in India, uh, and the Tibetan Youth Congress have uh, called on me to be a speaker very often when there's an important event going on. So for instance, when the Olympics at, uh, in, in uh, Beijing were being held, the Tibetans were making the protest in uh, New York, right in front of the Chinese consulate. So I was the featured speaker. And uh, later I was told there were a lot of cameras from the embassy building zooming in and uh, trying to track who's who and who's saying what. And I've made some of the points that I also made tonight on the strategic significance of Tibet in a political sense for India, for the United States. Uh, it's not just a human rights cause or, a, 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 you know, it, it's often neglected politically because it doesn't have oil and it doesn't have, it doesn't seem to have strategic location, but actually it has an immensely strategic location, which I, which I talk about. 
But to start off, I want to give a little survey of what are some of the issues uh, and what is some of the history of uh, US-India political relations. But until the Clinton administration, India was sort of on the fringes of uh, US uh, interest. It was sort of in the backwaters, another exotic, some struck far away place that travel writers wrote about and National Geographic wrote about, so made some documentaries, but it was not on the, uh, the front lines of uh, US attention. And this is very unfortunate because a lot of time was lost. Uh, a lot of time had been lost in that process. Uh, <clears throat> the business uh, dealings uh, with this technology outsourcing actually preceded the political interest. It's the business, the business industrial people who created the connection first, and then the political connection uh, followed uh, later. And Clinton, uh, Clinton discovered India in the final year of his presidency. He visited India, and he's visited India over ten times since, and so has uh, Hillary Clinton. And uh, on many occasions, uh, they both said that uh, they wish they had discovered and started the relationship while he was president because they could have done a lot more. Uh, but it, it is Clinton who opened the door, uh, but didn't uh, open it, didn't really uh, push that much because he was at the tail end of his tenure. And then Bush uh, took over in a very positive way, very uh, active style of managing the relationship. And a lot of things happened in the Bush administration that uh, made the two countries much closer. Part of it was 9-11, uh, which, uh, which required uh, friends in their neighborhood, in that area. Uh, so there was a political tie-up, but a large part of it had to do with the rapidly expanding uh, business and technology uh, positive kind of relationships between the two countries. So the question is, uh, what is happening now uh, during the uh, during the uh, election campaigns? Obama made a lot of statements about the strategic significance of India, and Indians were so sure uh, at the on the eve of the uh, election uh, they were so sure that all our problems will be solved because this man will get elected, and he did get elected. So I went to India in uh, November after the elections, uh, and uh, people were just very sure. That's when the Bombay terror attack had happened. And so the thinking was that we really don't have to worry, just wait till January, the moment uh, Obama comes in, next morning you'll see what these guys will do for us and they'll solve our problems. And I would tell him that you're being incredibly naive, you have to solve your own problem, no one's going to solve that problem for you. But there is this big expectation that the US will be there for them and there's a, perhaps an over-dependence on that and I will talk, talk about that theme. Well, Obama <coughs> so far has not put India at all in the center stage of his, uh, his international policy. He has had no time to go there, uh, in which he said he was one of the first places he would go, do would be to go to India. And uh, he's gone everywhere else, including Copenhagen to get some Olympic Games and stuff like that. And he's been in the region, uh, traveling in that region, but never had the four, same four hours to drop in India, which would have done a huge amount of uh, political good. But he hasn't done that. Uh, now, uh, it's a mystery. Suddenly, from this uh, dependence on uh, Obama's, Obama's our man, and when he, when he gets in, everything will be fine, to, uh, well, you know, it's taking a little longer, he's got many other things on his plate. All of a sudden, the latest reading of uh, Indian thinkers is turning negative. Uh, and, and it's becoming negative that uh, Obama is actually solving the economic problems based on dependence on China and cannot offend China, and therefore he compromise India for that. Uh, and he will solve the Afghanistan problem by dependence on Pakistan, and he will tilt uh, against India because he cannot offend them. And therefore that, uh, not because there's any, any problem he has with India, he still speaks very highly of India whenever he does have, him, but have two minutes to speak about it. But in terms of the actions, the actions don't match the same kind of words. So <clears throat> even the Dalai Lama, His Holiness Dalai Lama, who is in town in Washington, uh, was denied meeting with Obama. Okay, very interesting. Uh, even some others were told to go meet him. 
And then the, <coughs> the buzz, which I got from the Tibetan community, said that uh, uh, China wouldn't like him to uh, validate Obama, or validate His Holiness. So he, he, China is, would be upset. So he didn't want to upset China by meeting him. This sort of a uh, uh, tilt is happening. And uh, <coughs> as you know, between India and China, there is a there is a the state of India, Arunachal Pradesh, which China claims to be, to be its property, which when the British divided and made all those boundaries, they made it very clear that it was part of India. But China claims it to be its. And one of the arguments they've given is that there's a very ancient Tibetan monastery there. And so if, if it, Tibet is part of China, then all, everywhere there's Tibetan monastery uh, of some antiquity. So there is a claim like that. And, uh, and so this, uh, this uh, region has a lot of strategic importance uh, for, for India. And the, uh, the Dalai Lama is uh, planning a visit to that monastery. And so China has protested that he shouldn't visit because it's China's and he should get China's permission before he can visit. And uh, they've also uh, uh, done some official things like if somebody's from that state and he uh, wants to travel to China, uh, they will give him a visa as though he's from, from, a China, from China itself. He will, they'll give him a visa not from, on the Indian passport. So they're doing more than uh, simple things. It's more than just simple gestures to sort of assert their territorial claim, and that's a that's a serious matter. So, to uh, to put the U.S. India in context, I'm going to talk about two kinds of relationships. One is direct bilateral, which tend to be very positive right now. There's no major crisis or major problem between the two countries directly, but then. Another category of relationship is concerning third parties. Could be China, could be Myanmar, uh, could be Pakistan, you know, third parties, could be Iran. And that's where there are a lot of tension spots, and those tension spots can be pretty serious. But on, in terms of the positive bilateral relations, it's worth mentioning what they are because they, are, they, they have been achieved recently. I've already mentioned that the business relations are thriving, so Indian businessmen and their American counterparts are closer than ever. And there's lots of joint ventures and collaborations going on between the two countries. And the trade, uh, purely uh, commercial trade, uh, industry to an industry is thriving. Indian students are uh, enjoying good career, good education in the United States, like Women's College. And that's an area of uh, positive collaboration. In India has more students in this country than any other country, any other foreign students. This is a statistic. Uh, I think last year was some 85,000, something like that, and it's going up all the time. Um, <clears throat> Indian pop culture, from yoga to samosas to music to Bollywood to fashions and all that, enjoys a lot of uh, success in the United States and vice versa. Uh, Indians are very fond of American lifestyle and American culture and things of that kind. So those are, uh, those are good things. Uh, a lot of uh, people like me who are immigrants are doing well in this country. A lot of people who are here from the Indian community, are they owe a lot to the United States uh, being their land of adoption and they are thriving, doing well and uh, America has been very generous to us. So that's also a very positive thing. And then there was a recent uh, 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 nuclear energy cooperation or peaceful uses uh, agreement, uh, so India can buy uh, nuclear uh, nuclear plants for energy because the dependence on oil and gas is not good for political reasons, for economic reasons, for environmental pollution reasons, and there had been a U.S. embargo on India for a long time, which was crippling India's ability to create energy because India doesn't have enough uh, oil and gas. So then what else do you do? The only thing you can do is burn coal, and then curb coal uh, creates is a big environmental problem. It uh, creates all these, uh, these gases and heat and energy. And so uh, the US and the international community are very upset that both China and India have uh, not uh, controlled their uh, faucet, their burning of coal, uh, uh, which has an environmental problem. China, many, many times more than India. 
But then if you look at it from their point of view, neither of those countries have their own enough oil and gas. And uh, the nuclear industry for energy has not, for very various reasons, developed. In India's case, it was not allowed. Politically, in China's case, it was allowed, but it didn't develop. So this opens up that uh, possibility. And there's also a lot of cooperation now to fight terrorism. So these are some of the positives, and they're all sort of bilateral. But I think being large and being complex, you are going to expect uh, problems also. Because when people ask, what does, when people in India ask me, I go four or five times a year and I give many talks, and they ask me, what, do, what does America think of this or that? I have to tell them that America is not sort of one voice, just like India is not one voice. There's many groups, many factions, many points of views, many parties, and they all have different postures on different things. And these postures are also moving, point, moving parts. They keep shifting. So naturally, if you have two complex entities with a lot of moving parts, then you're going to see many tensions also. So I list uh, uh, a few for just to set the discussion. The US has some anxieties on India, and India also has a lot of anxieties concerning the US. So one of the US anxieties is that India has had good relations with Iran. And uh, the US would like to uh, boycott and get India off of Iran, but India, is, uh, India wants to cultivate with the energy suppliers because it has a dire need. And uh, the closest geographically major energy exporter closest to is Iran. So it is a natural thing uh, for India to do that. Uh, then the US complains that Pakistan is offended uh, about India's successful uh, work in Afghanistan. India has a very successful presence in Afghanistan. It's not military. It's to build up society, economic, industrial, creating jobs, education, social work, these kind of programs. Uh, because India decided rather than helping on the military front, we should help in the help build society. And in certain, in many, many large sections of many districts uh, and states within Afghanistan, they they welcome Indians, they're very friendly to the Indians, and this has upset the Pakistanis. And so, for some strange reason, uh, the Obama administration has also started uh, uh, one, uh, encouraging India to downsize its presence in Afghanistan, which is kind of concerning Indians why, as to why the Obama administration should want to downsize India's presence, because that's what Pakistan would like to see. Um, there used to be a tension uh, spot from the US point of view, which is less now, concerning opening up markets, opening up commercial markets. But India has opened up all kinds of markets. There's Americans investing in all, uh, all sorts of things. So there's very little restrictions for foreign investment that are operating in India. I mean, compared to most of the countries, India is a very open, uh, as far as the investment climate is concerned. So that uh, was used to be always a point of contention whenever the two countries would meet. They would, the US would always say, we need you to open this market and that market. Well, the markets have been open now. Um, and then there is the issue of uh, US is uh, uh, generally uh, uh, concerned about uh, human rights within India. And I'll talk a little bit about that. The US says that there are, there are all the human rights issues, particularly when, they, uh, when uh, there is reports about the problems concerning Christians in India. And the Indians feel that that is not really ca the case. That is exaggerated, don't have a proportion, and the US is just meddling. So there is that kind of uh, tension spot. Now, the Indian point of view on what are the issues uh, are as follows. One is that um, uh, the Obama administration seems to be uh, trusting Pakistan with weapons again, even though the CIA and everybody has verified over and over again that they've used these weapons, misused them, not for the purpose intended, but used them against India. And now General Musharraf also in the BBC interviews said that uh, during his time they were taking the weapons and redeploying them for other purposes. Uh, everybody talks, and New York Times writes articles that uh, we are very concerned and we will ask some questions and we will warn them, but none of, none of that affects the uh, going on giving of more such weapons. And uh, also uh, of concern to India is uh, US favoring China. <coughs> Despite uh, China's lack of democracy, uh, there is an international aggressiveness of China, whether it's with Tibet, whether it's with Taiwan and other places. Uh, the, Tibet oppression is an issue, but still the U.S. has looked the other side. Uh, the U.S. Uh, manufacturing sector has been decimated by China, 
and uh, uh, still, I mean, there's a huge uh, amount of uh, uh, work labor displacement and long-term uh, economic uh, financial problem created by that, and still the U.S. Uh, has, in, rather than reducing that dependency, has kind of played into that dependency. And China's record of uh, uh, internal human rights and lack of transparency in their financial and industry and governance is not there. Uh, U.S. criticizes on all of these issues. You know, nothing I'm telling you is not known already. But after criticizing, uh, there's no action. It's sort of, or a little bit of action here and there symbolic, but not any tough stand. Uh, so more Indians are now, many of the policy makers are becoming a bit cynical. Many of the articles and thinkers now are saying that uh, where is Obama's action promised uh, to, uh, to India? All the actions seem to be shifting a little bit away. In fact, uh, people are saying that uh, things were far better with Bush than with Obama, which is kind of very ironic compared to where they ought to have been. Indians have also been concerned uh, about uh, a huge uh, Christian right-wing campaign centered from the United States. There's a group called Joshua Project in Denver that have uh, targeted India as the place where they want to just sort of carpet bomb with a whole lot of propaganda, like I put in billions of dollars uh, and uh, uh, convert people on a very large scale. And they have very aggressive campaigns, you know, of uh, 10,000 churches per state and so on, very big time. And these are, uh, uh, these are linked to uh, dishing out data on human rights because human rights becomes a way to open the door and get in. And often the two go hand in hand. When a country is targeted for conversion, and this is the truth of the last 400 years in different parts of the world, when uh, a country is targeted for conversion, then uh, the, there's a huge uh, campaign that they have human rights problems and we have to go bring them freedom and bring them human rights and help them out and so on. And under that pretext, a whole lot of uh, missionaries go in. And this happened in the Carter administration, happened in the Reagan administration, Clinton administration. This is, this is an old story. And, there are all, and some of these then turn into separatist identities, like in the state of Nagaland, uh, which is mostly almost all Christianized. Uh, then they're starting to look for separation from India uh, because they don't, they, their identity has been shifted so much that they don't see themselves as Indian. So it, is not, it doesn't end with Christianizing, it also de Indianizes the pockets which are highly Christianized. Uh, so this is an issue from the Indian side. There's also uh, issues that India is not raising, uh, which are there, but the community is raising. For example, problems with school textbooks that some of us here are involved in, media biases, academic uh, misportrayals, and so on. Uh, many of the, many of the uh, areas uh, uh, of such concern, the government, the Indian government has not had the courage or audacity to take those up as, as an issue. Now, what I'm going to uh, uh, discuss uh, in the next segment of my talk is uh, specifically in China, because I think that uh, there is not enough focus on a particular kind of issue that ought to concern both countries. China is driven by two, uh, there are two imports it needs very badly. Uh, one is oil and the other is it needs water. It needs water, lot of water. So China is uh, turning uh, Myanmar into a, a way to access shortcut, cut off the whole of Southeast Asia and have access from the Indian Ocean to Ch to, through Tibet to China, which is why Tibet is very strategically important. And this access, there's a naval base in the Indian Ocean uh, uh, in, in Myanmar that China has made. And from there, there's railroad link to China, there's an oil pipeline, and there's a big highway. So that corridor is the Chinese have spent at least it for some of money. And on the other side of India, on the uh, western side of India, there's a very similar arrangement to Pakistan. There's a port Pakistan has uh, leased out to China. China has made a naval base there. So right near the uh, Middle East oil supply, the oil tankers can go there. And uh, the oil can be taken by rail, it can be taken by road, and it can be taken by pipeline uh, through Tibet to China. So there are these two uh, things that are concerning India because they are on both, both sides of, of, of India. 
Uh, and um, these are of strategic relevance uh, for, uh, for China's needs, legitimate needs, but they also have political military implications. The next, the other kind of thing that uh, uh, China needs very badly, and India is kind of now beginning to get some concern about, is water. So uh, water, if you look at all the North Indian rivers, they start in Tibet. I mean, all the, the Indus, the Ganges, the uh, Brahmaputra, they all start in Tibet. And the, but luckily for India, while the rivers start in Tibet, the amount of water that, uh, in, that is there in Tibet is uh, like 2-3% of the total river water because Tibet is a mostly dry place. So the rivers get their water after they enter India. After they enter India, there's heavy snows, heavy rains, and that's where 98% of the water comes. But the areas within India, which are in the Himalayan belt, where all this water comes down, are claimed by China. The one is Arunachal Pradesh, the Brahmaputra River uh, goes through Arunachal, and Arunachal has the highest rainfall per square meter in the world. It's the, just sort of raining all the time, and uh, it's got the most, most amazing wildlife and, and uh, rainforests and all those things. And so uh, China claims that because that water then could be piped north through Tibet to China, which there is a plan that China has actually I have a report on that, which was circulated that. China has a report, uh, a proposal to integrate all these river sources and move the water towards China. So that's a big concern. The Ganges, the Ganga water, uh, doesn't, most of the water does not come from Gangotri or Gaumo, where the thing originates, but it comes from Nepal. Because when the, when the snows melt in Nepal and all the rain that falls into Nepal, it's got nowhere, no other way to the ocean except go to India. So all the, all the water that falls in Nepal, it ends up flowing into India. And that is what feeds the whole Ganges belt. The whole Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Bengal, all of that water, large part of that comes from Nepal. And a Chinese takeover of Nepal is not out of the question. I mean, there's a whole Maoist movement. Uh, they've, uh, the Maoists are, are, are in power in, uh, in, in Nepal. The Maoists are a base from Nepal to export the Maoism into India. There are many insurrections, Maoist insurrections in India. The Indian military is fighting these Maoists. They're getting the support from overseas. So you might say, well, besides this destabilizing uh, a rival, why is China doing all this? Well, it would love to have the Nepal water supply. It would love to give them a few billion dollars, which is a piece of cake now, and uh, control the economy, put in some hydroelectric power plants, because that water can be turned into electricity. And then that electricity can be shipped or, or you know, exported, and also the water can be controlled and exported towards China. So that, that the, then Sikkim, which is a state of India, and China, has, China had, until about a decade ago, recognized it as a state of India. When Nick Sikkim joined India, it officially uh, uh, was not uh, happy about it. China was not happy about it. But eventually, uh, as part of the peace deal, it was formally written that they recognized it. Uh, they just de-recognized it some years back. They de-recognized it. So they are also, uh, Sikkim is up on the table for negotiation as far as China is concerned. And Sikkim is a very uh, rich in uh, natural resources like rain and so on. So if you see the northern Himalayan rim, uh, rim uh, there, is a, there is a dispute that China considers that to be the case. And besides the Brahmaputra and the Ganges, the third river is Indus. Uh, Indus comes to Kashmir, which is a, it's got its own territorial dispute. So all of India, uh, even though currently has big water problems, you can imagine what would happen if these water sources were compromised. Uh, the, the, these are not simple issues. They are geopolitically very, very difficult issues and very ominous issues. And uh, there's a tendency among the Indian thinkers to sort of pretend it won't happen because we don't know what to do with it. So we assume it will all be fine. And uh, now that China is becoming more openly aggressive, people who have, have been saying this for over 15 years, now there is a lot of people echoing these concerns that these wars and these territorial claims are not just for nostalgic reasons and for human rights reasons and all that. It's really for natural resources like water because that, that is very uh, precious and scarce. So the, the strategic uh, significance of Tibet is so huge because Tibet is the buffer between China and India. 
and, and none of this water supply would be of any good to China if Tibet were autonomous. If Tibet were autonomous, then the route through Myanmar would be no good, the, their travel route through Pakistan would be no good, they would have no interest in, it, in collaborating with Pakistan, their uh, intrusion into Nepal would be of no significance, not possible because Tibet would come in the way, and their claims over Arunachal would not be there. So if Tibet were an autonomous place, actually India would uh, have a big boost in its security. And uh, so the reason why China wants Tibet is not because they want to control you know, a few million people and get rid of Buddhism, but there's a, that land is very, very strategically located. And this is something the US uh, international relations people have not taken seriously enough uh, as to the, the, st the strategic significance of uh, Tibet for, for, uh, it, from all these points of view. Now, the other um, issue, and, and then I want to turn over to question and answers. The other issue that uh, haunts U.S.-India relations is the way U.S. is tackling Pakistan. Uh, the the uh, uh, weapons, I, I wrote an article and sent it to one of the guys who was proposing all these uh, weapons sales, uh, that why don't you lease rather than sell? If you lease the weapons, at least you have a legal claim to get them back at some point in time, and they don't stay there permanently. But the U.S. is not, uh, Pakistan would not want that, so the U.S. is acquiescing. Uh, and many of the weapons that they're getting are uh, fighters, bombers, and the kind of weaponry that is not used for fighting terrorists, it's used for fighting a huge country like India. So they're really, uh, those weapons are, uh, have always been used in, against India, the U.S. weapons, and uh, still this is going on. Uh, there is, uh, the, the, the concern I have is that the Taliban have infiltrated uh, the ISI, Pakistan's ISI, the large uh, government within the government, the one that really controls the country, controls the army. Uh, and this is, uh, this, this uh, ISI infiltrated, I mean, Taliban infiltrated ISI uh, is at the heart of the power structure of the army. And the democracy is at the, uh, at, the, um, at the pleasure of the army. Army can sort of take over like it has dozens of times in Pakistan's history. Uh, the democracy is there because the US is saying you better let, leave the democracy alone, but it's not really internally a functioning democracy. So what happens when, not if, but when, uh, ISI and Taliban take over more of Pakistan? more uh, Pakistan, more control in Pakistan with all the nuclear weapons they have. What does that do to the security situation? And I can come up with many scenarios under which U.S. would withdraw. I mean, right now, the U.S. is thinking about do we stay there, do we get more troops, do we get less troops? And I don't think immediately the U.S. Obama will withdraw or anything like that. Uh, but I think every year or two, there will be the same thing will be up for negotiation again internally because the U.S. political structure does not want too many people being killed and the, the, uh, the sentiments against the war will become worse uh, and the Taliban know that it's a, it's a time game, it's a waiting game and if they outlast the U.S. patience, the U.S. will lose patience and eventually some, there will be political pressure at the time of elections to uh, get out of uh, Afghanistan. So how does the U.S. get out of Afghanistan? Uh, and save face domestically? Well, the answer is it can say, well, we've got a great deal with Pakistan, they look after our interests, and they are our friends, they are our allies, which is exactly what Pakistan would like to basically get the US to give them money, give them weapons, put them in charge, and they'll take control of the whole area and leave them alone. And they are very, very good at convincing uh, US policymakers for the last 60 years to uh, be able to persuade them. So I feel that. Uh, there is such a likelihood. And if uh, tomorrow morning we get up and the news headlines is that, you know, Bin Laden has been killed or captured or whatever, then, then it will be a perfect opportunity to say, okay, now our job's over, let's get out of there. Although it will be a symbolic thing, it doesn't mean that the Al-Qaeda or Taliban have been dismantled just because one guy has been taken out. It will really not make a difference to their power structure and their ability to perform or their goals. But it will be a political opportunity to say, okay, let's pack our bags, we can declare victory, we achieve success, and let's get out of there. So any number of scenarios, whether it's domestic pressure politically, whether it's something that happens over there, can get the US to sort of lose interest. After having gone, flared up a place, and lose interest is actually quite irresponsible. 
But Iraq was also a place that was not causing us trouble. And we went in thinking we can do something, and we didn't achieve, we did not succeed, uh, but then we cannot, we don't have the staying power, so we leave. Now it's worse mess from our security point of view than it was if, you know, before we got in there. So there is a precedence for the kind of scenario that I'm concerned about uh, happening again in the Afghanistan area. And so when you look at the issues India faces uh, from the China, uh, the northern rim, Himalayan rim from one end to the other vis-a-vis -vis China, that U.S. is not helpful in. In fact, if anything, it is definitely tilting in China's favor in those discussions. Uh, and uh, when you combine that with the challenges that India faces on the Pakistan side, with a huge amount of uh, Islamists being trained in the madrasas, a lot of uh, sleeper cells, Islamic cells within India, like we saw in the case of Mumbai, uh, and, and the potential for a Talibanized Pakistan, nuclearized Talibanized Pakistan, uh, getting out of hand, uh, this is a very ominous uh, combination of security matters uh, from India's point of view. Um, so, if you look at uh, uh, what that does for uh, U.S.-India relations, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's something that would certainly require, uh, you know, considering how many projects and programs Obama has started, then certainly looking at what these issues are ought to be one of them. But it hasn't received the top level attention that I believe it deserves. The debate uh, on uh, Afghanistan, the debate on Al Qaeda and, uh, uh, and Taliban it has shifted to uh, a very narrow, like what do we have to do to get rid of those guys who are hurting our, us in the United States? And they're really not looking at what happens in the region. Okay, after having stirred up the struggle, if we were to get out, even if they're not going to attack the United States, what will happen to the rest of that region? That is, the interest on that is being lost gradually. The, the kind of uh, uh, the political thinking which said that we really have to go after them and zap them out like a cancer, uh, that is kind of uh, no longer in vogue. And, and uh, recently in the last, just I would say a couple of weeks, maybe a month, a whole lot of uh, voices in India started raising this issue and getting very very concerned about it. So it's, a, it's an opportunity to debate what are the uh, international relations uh, issues that the two countries face. Uh, and uh, and I, what I've tried to do is lay out uh, issues, uh, scenarios, um, and uh, I would love to hear from you and get uh, some of your questions. So I think with that, I'll close, and we'll have some time for questions and answers. Thank you very much. Yes, Pandit. You said that Pakistan is very um, good at convincing the U.S. government in terms of their policy. What has the Indian government or the Indian people doing to convince the American administration in their favor? I lived in the United States for uh, 38 years, and I have watched the. Uh, one ambassador after another, one diplomat after another from India, and somehow they have not been able to really uh, explain what India is all about to American government people. Uh, because you know, you look at a civilization, you look at its uh, uh, the spiritual values that Americans relate to, you look at its democracy, you look at its openness, you look at its multiculturalism, its pluralism. Somehow the Indian side has not been able to sell a very solid civilizational link the way Israelis have. The Israelis have sold a civilizational link. And then the politics comes, political benefits come. Somehow the Pakistanis have been very skillful uh, in reading the minds of who they're dealing with and how to work with them and presenting a, a sense of being very certain, reliable, honest, truthful, that kind of a person. I would recommend you a book uh, by uh, Andrew Rotter, R-O-T-T-E-R. -T -T -E he's, uh, he's a historian at uh, Colgate University. And uh, it's something, it's some title, something about comrades in something or other. It's about uh, US relations with, with India and Pakistan. And uh, he shows uh, declassified CIA documents during the Nixon era and the Johnson era, the Cold War era, because you know, uh, 
uh, CIA documents which are classified. After 25 years, you can file a petition and uh, you can get them declassified. So this guy got them declassified. And he's showing how, what the thinking was of the top American uh, policymakers from CIA and FBI and the White House and the UN heads and NATO and all that, all the top Americans. What was their thinking about those two countries which led to their favoring Pakistan and not India? And it's a fantastic book and I'm actually writing a whole summary of that in a, as a chapter in a book that I'm writing now. What made them feel very kind of uh, uh, consider India to be something they cannot deal with, something very unmanageable, very complex, something not definable. Uh, uh, while Pakistan is very defined, located, clear, what, whether you like them or not, at least it's more clear. And this book does a very good job, and I, I would recommend that policy, Indian policymakers and diplomats ought to read it to understand the American mind where, as to where this discomfort comes from. So that, I think, could be a way to understand the American issues. What do they think of India? What they were they writing in confidence in classified memos, which now became reclassified? That tells you something. Uh, there has been a Pakistan-centric uh, 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 State Department doctrine, which has, as you have mentioned, actually over the past 60 years, which has actually driven the uh, uh, US uh, uh, policy in that uh, uh, region. Um, is there a uh, alternate uh, a document, um, a, a doctrine which has been formulated or in progress, which actually just uh, uh, looks at it actually from you know the Indian perspective, actually just playing uh, you know the, like India playing uh, uh, that particular uh, thing. You know, you're talking about that uh, uh, that discourse needs to be uh, shifted. But given the plethora of uh, uh, academic work that has been done. Washington DC or elsewhere. Um, is there a uh, existing doctrine that suits uh, India better yes. in its interest? See, it's very ironic. I mean, you'd expect uh, Democrats to be more India friendly, but you know, the Bush era uh, people, a lot of them are at Princeton. So the Woodrow Wilson School has got a lot of uh, conservative people uh, on their policies towards uh, you know Islam and uh, Middle East policies and all China and all that. It, it's quite interesting that they, it was this kind of people who originated this thesis that in the U.S. should nurture India as to counter China influence, the U.S. should nurture India to counter Islam influence, you should, U.S. should build India as the main Asian power. There are all these doctrines. And it was this group that pushed through the nuclear deal to get India on board. It was this group that uh, a lot of corporate people are like that, a lot of because they're looking at it from a practical standpoint. And so when there's a shift in governments, uh, you know, the top president may say one thing, he may be very ideologically Gandhian and so on, but the whole machinery has to be, you know, machinery is what works. And so the kind of people who are in the new machinery are not these kind of people who are interested in taking on China and getting India on board or taking on a big, uh, you know, terrorism and get fight that and get India on board. So they do not use, they do not see the same strategic use of a relationship. They are more driven by actually the U.S. is very much uh, driven by uh, making sure China is not upset at us. Very much concerned about you know because they are bankrolling the U.S. debt right now. We cannot afford to upset our bankers, and if their you know, call comes and says, "Don't meet the Dalai Lama," then okay, we're not going to meet him. We need our, you know, seven hundred billion dollars of treasury bills being bought by the Chinese, more so than meeting the Dalai Lama. So I think um, those voices are there, but they are not prominent right now. now I will, I'll also be telling you something. I mean, I, I'm not afraid to name names because that's the way international relations is. There's a guy called um, Jonah Blank who got his PhD in Harvard in anthropology. On, uh, he did an uh, interpretation of Ramayana, very much a racist uh, Aryan versus Dravidian interpretation of Ramayana as a kind of, you know, uh, that these groups were the blacks of India, they were the whites of India. He's kind of put that in, in frame. That was his thesis, so you can know where he's coming from. He uh, got uh, into uh, the uh, Joe Biden's uh, Senate uh, as the advisor on South Asia, for those Biden. And uh, when the uh, Christian right lost uh, 
there's uh, many of the congressmen and many of the senators who were backing their point of view on South Asia. One of them wrote that uh, we've got our man in Joe Biden's office, we're graduating now. So they, that guy was cultivated. And now he's in the Council on Foreign Relations, he's in the, uh, in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, he's a consultant and advisor on South Asia. And he's the guy who co-authored in, uh, before the Obama administration took over, even, even before that when they co-authored this idea that there should be $11 billion aid package to Pakistan over five years, he was one of those who co-authored it. So you have to look at how much can happen with a few individuals who exert a lot of influence and, and, uh, and who spent a whole career studying, he's visited India, he's written books. I mean, so a few scholars in South Asia who can, who have a certain ideological point of view, who get into the right spots, have an enormous amount of leverage. And uh, we just don't have enough India friends and they're doing all these things. Now, this is an amazing thing that somebody of that sort would get into the democratic side and have his influence. But that's what's going on. But could you actually just you know, shine some light on um, as uh, the Talibanization and uh, and the Taliban uh, ISI access uh, uh, domination over uh, uh, Pakistan increases? Um, what is the next step actually? Just you know, that you see in terms of and uh, the U.S. policy with respect to Kashmir. How does it actually just uh, see? I, I think that the implication of an Islamized Pakistan. Pakistan is already Islamic, Islamized. They call themselves Islamic Republic and Sharia is the law, so it's already Islamized. But having it Talibanized, more radicalized, the implication for India is not localized to Kashmir. I mean, we should forget that. We should forget that what is at stake is Kashmir. That is just the first piece. What is at stake is much of North India. I mean, there is a, the Mullah Omar of the Taliban made a speech in which he said he wants to recreate the Mughal Empire. That is Taliban's goal. And in a speech which is, uh, I have somewhere, this speech was brought to my attention by Akbar Ahmed, who was former Pakistan ambassador to England and now a professor in American University. He's, he lived in Princeton, so we became friends, and he invites me to American University to address his class on these kinds of matters. So the Pakistani uh, former diplomat who in fact told me that Mullah Omar, his goal, he is announced publicly, and then he gave me the reference in the Pakistani paper, his goal is to fly the Taliban flag on the Red Fort of Delhi and to create the Mughal Empire because he feels that the, his, that the Taliban are the successors of the Mughals and in between the British have no right to take over. So we have to throw out the, we threw out the British, now some bunch of Indians have taken over, but we have to get back what was ours. And so the Talibanization is not about Kashmir. It is, it is a much more ambitious plan. I mean, they'd like to take from Bangladesh, Northern India, Pakistan, Afghanistan as the Taliban uh, region. And this is something which is in India not considered politically correct to talk about because it's better to just pretend everything is fine and we'll all be okay and you know, we'll just send them some uh, Diwali gifts and they send us some presents and we love each other. That kind of a, uh, uh, kind of goody-goody mentality exists. And uh, they're not realistic in, uh, you do not have journalistic books and investigative books which are analyzing Taliban speeches and taking it seriously and saying, what are they thinking? Let's just learn about it. See, Yale University hired a former Taliban uh, government cabinet minister onto the faculty. You know about it? Some four or five years ago. And uh, it became controversial. And Yale University did the right thing. They said, we need to know, we need our next generation of American leaders to know how they're thinking. How is the enemy thinking? We must learn. So if one of their professors comes and he wears his clothes and he teaches his ideology, we would like to know what his ideology. It doesn't mean that we are buying it, but we, are, we cannot uh, ignore them. We must know their mind. This kind of studying the other has not yet happened in the Indian thinkers. So there's a kind of a denial mode. So people aren't taking them seriously enough, in my opinion. They just look at one episode, that episode is put away, so everything goes back to normal until the next episode, but there is no overarching strategy as to what are they up to and what do we have to do about it. This is the big picture. Um, the Obama administration came into power earlier this year. There was immediately some uh, from the uh, State Department or wherever it was, there was Kashmir, uh, um, the activism on part of the State Department with regards to uh, Kashmir. And uh, um, 
trying to play a negotiator between India and Pakistan and yes. so on. Yes. Where has that arrived and actually just you know, what, what do you think if you really extrapolate um, everything else that you have spoken um, or uh, observed, um, how do you extrapolate as a US uh, influencing what kind of uh, um, path um, on Kashmir? See, uh, I think US is, uh, my guess is, the US is telling Pakistan you put Kashmir in the back burner and you solve the Taiwan problem inside your country. For that, we will give you money, weapons, all kinds of support. And we will convince India to keep out of the way. And Pakistan is demanding a huge price for it. Huge price for it you know, in all kinds of ways. And one of Pakistan's demands is that you should also uh, pressure India to get out of Afghanistan so we can take over. That's a very dangerous thing because Afghanistan and India have been traditionally very close to each other for a very long period of time. So India has responded by saying, why are we going to take get out of there? We have our own relationship there from uh, Tajikistan and from Central Asian countries. India has actually got an Air Force base also. So India has a good presence there. Now, the Obama administration is sort of counting on Pakistan to come through uh, with its promise. And uh, you can never be right, you can never be 100% sure of what your forecast is. So I guess those who have promoted this idea must be optimistic about it. But I, for one, think that it's a complete sham because the this war will keep getting worse. The U.S. will keep getting sucked in with more money and weapons that Pakistan will, will ultimately, when the U.S. leaves, they leave the weapons behind. I mean, all this heavy weaponry just left behind. Nobody ever brings it back. I mean, it's just left behind because the deal is struck that, you know, the other the Pakistan and Arabia are friends and they look after it. And then once the U.S. is gone, then like when uh, the Taliban was created by the by the U.S. to fight the Soviets, yeah. Mujahideen. 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 But the Mujahideen became, the, uh, the, I mean, their kids went to the school became the Taliban. So the, the Taliban is the, is the result of that. So they were created, but the U.S. did not bring the Stinger missiles or those things back, which is so stupid, you know. And uh, Dan Rather, on 60 Minutes, used to, for five, ten years after the Soviets left, he would go to the arms bazaar of Peshawar and show that you can buy a tank, you can buy an anti-craft gun, you can buy a uh, stinger, and all this is American weaponry left behind because uh, we partnered with the Soviets and we just gone, and these are on the black market. He was saying, this thing I can buy for $5, this thing I can buy for $50. Why didn't the U.S. go in and mop up all of that stuff, buy it off the streets and dump it, throw it away, just get it out? That is a weapon being used now against the U.S. It's U.S. weapons being used. So U.S. has a very notoriously short-sighted, uh, you know, radar uh, when it comes to leaving, when it comes to exit strategies. Then what will happen to the billion and a half people of South Asia is hardly on anybody's radar. Is we have to uh, look after ourselves, our homeland. What we have to do for that is what we do. But if it gets out of hand for those guys out there in the other end of the world, that's not a problem. That's how the US, I suspect and fear, will leave one day. It's like left in, out of uh, Vietnam. It was no thought of what happens to Vietnamese people. Um, so I feel that uh, US is thinking only a certain period of time and not playing out the game. And the Taliban are long-term players. They're, they're wait, they keep fighting it for as long as it takes to get rid of the, anybody else and take control. So this is uh, short term versus long term. This is kind of a follow up question to uh, the previous questions. Uh, the past few months, the hardline Taliban has been killing off some of the more moderate members of his organization. Um, it has been sort of, as you mentioned with the speech about the Mughal Empire, been sort of ramping up its its ideology. Do you feel that uh, this is part of the reason why the U.S. is so nervous about staying in Afghanistan? Or, and how do you feel this will? Well, as yes, as India? I think your, your reading is correct, that the Taliban have realized that if they act tough, there's casualties, and uh, uh, they scare the U.S. out of there. And uh, they probably will succeed in doing that, is my guess. Not right away, not in the next year or two, but I don't think U.S. is going to last there for a very, very large number of years uh, and continue facing the casualties and fighting a tough war. Uh, but the consequences of leaving will be short-term devastation of India, Pakistan first and then India, 
And medium term, not long term even, but medium term, it will come back to the US in a way that the US will really not know what to do because it will become a very globalized, a huge region of Taliban with nuclear weapons. And you will see the US, the history will say that the US not only failed to get rid of that problem, but by its, by its very inconsistent and erratic behavior, getting involved and messing around here and there and then leaving, uh, incited and, and triggered more, uh, ex accelerated the uh, hand of the Pakistan, of the Taliban. So I, I feel that uh, the area studies, the blame goes not to the people in the government who are not experts, but they have, uh, the US State Department has uh, nurtured 2,000 people in area studies, South Asia studies, South Asia studies, from Harvard to Berkeley to UPenn to, you know, there are about 30 centers. Uh, and 2,000 area South Asia experts have been produced who are professors and scholars and work in think tanks and whatnot. And uh, they, are, they are the brain trust of uh, telling us what's going on. And I know a lot of them, and I critique their work. And I must say that uh, that investment hasn't uh, produced good quality thinking. And because a lot of them are personally, ideologically driven in some way, and they are they spend their whole career championing that particular ideology. Uh, they have some biases, some of them. So the bad advice, I would say, I locate as the South Asian studies failure. Yeah, Rajiv, is this, uh, is this, you're suggesting that maybe India and US have something in common which is being inconsistent and not? Yes. Yes, I think that uh, uh, US and India have a common interest in uh, uh, Tibetan autonomy, is one thing, because it will help in dealing with China. I gave the geographical reasons. Uh, U.S. and India have in common uh, a very uh, tough fight against uh, Taliban, and not just against Al Qaeda. There, there is this uh, Farid Zakaria saying that Al Qaeda we shouldn't fight; we should fight the Al we should, uh, we should only fight Al Qaeda because they might come after us. But Taliban will only go after the local South Asian people. So why is it an American problem? This is a very dangerous idea uh, because, uh, and I think. Not enough Americans understand the links of this network. There's no separation between Taliban and Al Qaeda. They're all fighting for the same uh, jihad, and they just uh, uh, divide amongst themselves roles, which they keep shifting around. Uh, the people who move from one to the other, it's not like we are really separated by a Chinese wall or something like that. And you cannot say we uh, will ignore one and fight the other. So the it's amazing that eight years have gone by in this war, and it's a very tiny region. It's a very, very tiny region of territory. Uh, and the US has not put in an investment. I think the biggest blunder Bush made was that he did not put all those troops to Iraq of Afghanistan. By now, they would have finished the, off the problem. The troops that they put to Iraq were not necessary. That war was a useless war. If they had gone and fought the uh, Afghanistan war with the same might, they would have solved the problem and not even created the problem in Iraq. So we didn't solve the problem that existed, which became worse. And we created a new problem, which didn't even exist too much. So uh, this is what Obama inherited. Uh, but I think uh, I have, I'm not uh, optimistic, at least based on the kind of foreign policy discussion that are going on. I'm not optimistic that there is that will to really take on the Taliban big time and hold uh, Pakistan uh, responsible. And, uh, and uh, you know, the U.S. has, uh, uh, Musharraf has also said that U.S. almost uh, decided to invade uh, Pakistan, okay, uh, after 9-11, because all the people got training, in, uh, all these terrorists got their training in Pakistan, and all these nukes uh, in violation of the international treaties. So U.S. was almost to the point of going in and invading Pakistan. So what was the Pakistani reaction? It was not that they were tough enough to take him on. They were scared. They were really scared. They didn't have anything. But US has somehow not had the courage to take on that, that very dangerous uh, situation that exists in Pakistan directly. They want to work through somebody, then they give him money, and he's supposed to solve the problem, but he pockets half the money. You know, so US has not had a direct uh, uh, confrontation with the Pakistani Taliban, which I, without which I do not think the problem can be solved. I think I, my question was the other way, whether US and India suffer from the same problem of being inconsistent, number one. Oh, yes. Number two, not being bold yes. to take on whatever the problem is. Yes. Number three, they're not being, maybe there is a disconnection 
between the public perception of the problem versus the government solution. Yes, it's like you, you know, too much democracy and openness suffers in both countries. Yeah, it's like you're playing chess with me, and uh, what you are doing will be you have a committee and they're talking about it and broadcasting it and they're debating it in the media and I'm listening, they're watching. Obviously, and I'm not doing the same to you. I'm keeping my cards to my vest, close to my vest. Then obviously I have an advantage in understanding you, but you don't really have the same advantage in me. So this is the problem, the price of being a very open society. And also inconsistency, that we know that in the four-year cycle, and you know, if in the 2010 elections the Democrats don't do very well, then they'll say, oh, this is, this is Obama's Iraq, and we've got to get out of there. The whole pendulum will swim the other way. The Taiwan strategists, Al-Qaeda strategists, are watching all this. They are very smart guys. They know that they just have to outlast the American attention span and the American sort of uh, very short-term commitment and short-term passion. Just outlast it and keep creating a few casualties every once in a while and the Americans will have to go away and then we can just control over territory. And that territory, if you look at the map, we don't have one here. If you look at the Horn of Africa going through the Middle East, which is Islamic, Arab countries, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, North India, Bangladesh, all the way to Indonesia, that's a crescent. And there's a vision there that there'll be this crescent of uh, Islam and that'll be like 50% of the world population lives there. Now that is not a, a, a joke to, uh, have, to just sort of laugh at. It is a scenario that cannot be just dismissed. And I'm not predicting that this is a valid scenario. I'm saying it's a scenario that has to be considered. A question? Hi, I'm totally different topic really, but um, you raised the point about Nepal. Um, I've recently um, been befriended by a, a wonderful family, a Nepalese family, and they're refugees from Nepal. And um, grandmother, grandfather, uh, you know, so three generations living together, and I'm helping them, and um, it's a beautiful experience for me. And, and so when I find out a little bit more um, the challenges of language barriers and they're learning more English and I'm trying to learn a little bit of um, Nepalese, I think that's how you say it. Um, and I, it's very beautiful. Um, I realize that, um, like you said, the um, religious services have been the ones who have been pulling them over and um, getting them out of these camps, which they've been in, which I didn't know about personally. Um, for 17 years, uh, this family in particular has been in a camp and they've been relocated to this area where I live in Western Massachusetts. And um, on one hand, I see the benefits of this um, Christian um, ability to give money and support and everything, but on the other hand, they are doing this brainwashing and extracting their culture, and I, I often say to them, oh, but you have a beautiful culture, and I honor that, I think that's a beautiful thing. So. I just want to kind of pose that information to you and see yes. what I say. I'm actually an art major, okay. but I'm interested in people and social sure. issues. Sure, no, that's so very good. I'm very glad to, uh, to hear your interest. Yeah, I'm uh, uh, one of the books, um, which is kind of uh, first version of it is drafted, is the whole uh, a Christian infiltration and uh, a kind of a Christian uh, uh, takeover of Indian identity in pockets from, from Nepal all the way to the south and how it's being masterminded, planned, it's like an international uh, you know, brainwashing, as you said, and they got billions of dollars. There's a project, Joshua, in, in, in Denver, which is coordinating all this. They have so many denominations and churches and all that. And they, this, this is to, they feel that uh, uh, denying them their culture, because an inferior culture, replacing it with our culture will actually help, but what it will do is it will create a broken people. It will create the people disconnected from their past, disconnected from their land, their dress, their ways, and, and in conflict with each other, which also they're encouraging, they're encouraging them to fight each other. So this is a very dangerous game that uh, the United States government, uh, including liberals like Jimmy Carter, supported this international evangelism. Of course, you'd expect Reagan and Bush to support it. Bill Clinton supported and signed the bill which created the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. It sounds very nice, religious freedom, everybody likes it. But what they're really doing is all the people on the Religious Commission, all the commissioners, are really radical right-wing Christians. And they have one agenda, 
which is to get U.S. government money and open doors and get in those countries and evangelize. And the definition of religious freedom is aggressive evangelism. And if you don't like my aggressive evangelism, then you're denying me my freedom. It's, it's sort of like the aggressor's rights. Aggression rights are called religious freedom in, in their vernacular. But they're not looking at the right of a culture to survive. And they're not, you know, the, the uh, UN Charter on uh, uh, Human Rights, uh, UN Charter on Genocide. I read the whole history of how this UN Charter on Genocide was created. And I'll mention this a little bit in my Gandhi talk tomorrow. Uh, in the original draft, which was done by a European Jew, a Jewish person, I think a Polish Jew, a very famous person, I forget his name. In that original draft, in the definition of what constitutes, uh, what constitutes genocide, he also included cultural genocide. But that certain countries, and I couldn't figure out which ones, but I can guess, certain countries objected that they will not be able to go and do this evangelism because it would be considered cultural genocide. Uh, Gandhi has a huge amount of uh, uh, criticism of missionaries in India for committing cultural genocide. Yeah? And so uh, the, the, the UN charter that passed on genocide only uh, uh, condemned physical genocide. So if you're physically doing something harm to a person that genocide, but if you are getting rid of their whole culture, religion, language, way of life, uh, there is no law against that. So this is an issue which human rights activists need to take on, the issue of cultural genocide. I agree with that. Um, I've spent one example I can give specifically is um, one of the, the gentlemen, he is a truck driver, over he licensed truck driver in Nepal, in the area. And over here, the test is not uh, something he can understand. It's He does not read Hindu, he reads Nepal, Nepalese and broken English, so it's very confusing. But he, he says to me, in my country, men drive, no women drive. I laugh, I said, oh, women here are very strong, but I appreciate that. <laughs> Um, it's very disappointing, so I'm looking, trying to figure out um, how can I, a little person, you know, I'm not a big entity, uh, how can I help um, break those barriers, get get this, get the um, written test for, you know, driving permits in Nepalese, not just 14 languages only for state of Massachusetts. I think that's a lot of, you know, <laughs> not appropriate to say, but um, it's very frustrating to me, and um, I would like to figure out how to address this. Thank you.